here. So I had to start that way. My name is Frank Bolden, and uh, I was born and raised in a small area of Moline in Manitoba, which is not too far north and west of Brandon. But I grew up there on the farm, uh, helped work along with my father and my two brothers, and uh, well, we had a good time there on the farm. Were your two brothers older than you? Uh, I was the middle brother. Um, I had one brother older and one younger. And uh, at this time on the farm, uh, we used to see these airplanes flying over from uh, number 12 SFTS here in Brandon, which is the Anson Plain. And then there was a, oh, I goofed again. It was the Anson fl Plain flying out of rivers, number one central navigation school at that time. And then the Cessna cranes were flying on a number 12 SFTS here in Brandon. Well, they made the rounds so many times a day, flying over the farm. I kind of decided then that's when I'm going to join the Air Force. Thought it looked like fun, huh? Mm hmm What about your older brother? Was he having the same thoughts? Did he go off with the uh, My older brother joined the Air Force also just a little bit later on, and he went for airframe mechanic. So uh, went on the farm there. Uh, my mother was not getting too well. She was very, when the war was, uh, Hitler was going all over in Europe and she was getting quite concerned, hoping her boys didn't have to go to war like her brother did in World War I. But my mother passed away in January 1939, which was a shock to us all. And father left with us three boys there to raise. So uh, it was a little change in life at that time. We went on anyway, continued farming, but then when the war started, so many of my friends, classmates and all that had joined up. So that's what I wanted to do too. And then of course, seeing these planes fly over, that's what I decided to go to the Air Force. So you went off to enlist, where did you go? Well, I enlisted in Winnipeg. Uh, I think it was August the 10th, 1942. Uh, when we went in at that time, they just give us our IQ tests and a few things like that. Uh, asked a bunch of questions, but then they told us that the classes were all filled for the aero engine mechanic and that he would have to call me later. Well, I was getting a little bit worried that uh, at that time they were starting to call up more and more for the Army. I uh, kind of wondered if that might happen to me. So I went back in in November and asked them how long it would be before they'd call me in. Well, they still weren't sure, but they, uh, I was uh, sworn in at that time, but still had to wait until January the 18th of 1943 before I reported to the Ford plant in Winnipeg. Now, this Ford plant originally was a Ford uh, a motor assembly plant, but they had cleared it out to make it available for the technical training school to train ground crew. So. When we went in there, we were still not in uniform. They supplied us with a pair of coveralls and our regular regulation boots. But then we had to uh, go out and find a boarding place. We were paid a regular dollar and a quarter a day, plus $30 a month to pay the rent for the time we were there. Would you have meals at, at the plant at all? Would they serve you meals? No, we had to take our noon lunch with us. We had the uh, breakfast at the boarding house and supper then again back at the boarding place and they, we had to take our lunch with us to noon. So what was the average day like there? What, what did they put you to work doing? Well, of course, most of it in the first place was lectures and maybe uh, showing what they had on hand to work. But an awful lot of it in the first place was just uh, lectures and they start showing you some of the uh, tools we'd be working with and some of the nuts and bolts. Well, I didn't, never did realize that bolts had so many designations. Each bolt for a certain place on an airplane has a place on the head of the bolt that would designate it for that. And then also for rivets. They had different specifications for rivets on the plane. So you had to learn all these different specifications. And then finally we got into the sheet metal place where 
we would be riveting a few pieces together and uh, onto that after we did a little bit of soldering or we would maybe make a, uh, a funnel or a, some metal can or something like that just to practice soldering. We had a short course of only a week, I think, on acetylene welding, which, uh, well, I never really had, uh, never really got onto that very much and never used it anyway as far as the Air Force is concerned. What kind of engines would you be uh, working on? Well, when I finally got up to the stage of looking at an engine, uh, it would be the Tiger Moth engine, which is just a four-cylinder, which turned as an inline motor. Uh, and then there was a seven-cylinder radial motor. And, of course, these were just set on a, on a stand. Uh, by this time, this is getting on to the end of our technical training in the Ford plant. We would uh, take these motors apart put them under, put the, all the pieces on separate little stands so you know where they were and you ought to put them back together. And uh, so we take them apart, put them back together again, and then we had to set on the magneto, have it timed to fire at the right time in the motor. And uh, then, of course, the instructor would come along and test to see if it was done, done properly. And uh, we passed that test when then we went on to the radial, as they call it, and had to do the same thing with that. Do you remember, Frank, how many uh, people were in a class with you? How many were there training? Well, in our class, I think there were 30. But I think there was, uh, well, I hate to say it right now, I think there maybe about six or eight classes in, in that, in that uh, Ford plant at that time. At one time, I should say. And the instructors, were some of them civilians, or were they all Air Force? All the instructors were civilians at the at the Ford plant, and they were very congenial. They were very friendly, and they would help you. Lots of ways they would even almost help you into the finished product, which sometimes needed a little help. <laughs> and uh, we had one Air Force person there. He was a service police, and he was a disciplinarian, and he made sure no one sat up on the bench for a minute or anything like that, or leaned against the bench because then you. Well, he always had some Saturday chores to do or something like that. So he was watching very closely. But we never did have any drill training or anything at that time. You just had to behave yourself. And then you were able to leave for supper and, and have an evening free. Would you go out on the town in Winnipeg? Oh, yes. We were free after, well, 4 o'clock, I guess. It was school hours. And yeah, we were free after 8 o'clock, or after 4 o'clock. And we could go home and have supper, and yeah, we had the evening free. Sometimes they had a bunch of books that maybe we should read up on and study a bit because there's exams going to come along pretty soon. Exams every three weeks, so uh, if you didn't pass that exam, then you were sent on some other place. So I kept you reading and thinking and keep you on the mark. So how long were you there in total? Well, I was at uh, went into the training school in Winnipeg at, in January, and the course lasted. I think I wasn't posted out until uh, May. I think it was. By that time, they had given us a uniform. I guess they figured we were going to be something, and uh, we were given our uniform, and we were sent home on a leave. Then to go home and show off my new uniform, but then I was posted then to Manning Depot in Toronto. Uh, how was your dad doing? Yeah, my father had to get some hired help, but uh, they seemed to feel as though he could manage that way, and we went on to the Air Force. So you went off to Toronto? Uh, yes, Manny Depot went to Toronto. Did you take the train right? to Toronto? Did I took the Manny Depot training in Toronto. Uh, but to get there, did you go on a train? Oh, yes, it was all train traffic in those days. So we trained Winnipeg to Toronto. The Manning Depot was in the uh, agricultural buildings in Toronto, something like the way it was here in Brandon, it was in the agricultural building. So we were, our bunks were in the uh, overhead bunk, or um, yeah, double bunk overhead, was in the uh, stall, and the manger was your uh, closet, and uh, <laughs> that's where we lived. 
imagine there were many, many, many men, lots of you, huh? Um, did your classmates from Winnipeg come as well? To the, whole, the whole class, a whole 30 of us, went from the technical training school to Manning Depot, and we were training. And that's when our lectures there started, our uh, rules and regulations of the Air Force, and uh, tell you how to salute, how to get your right foot in the right place at the right time, and uh, how to pray, of course. And, uh, and uh, uh, I've heard stories about lineups everywhere, lineups to get this and lineups to get oh, well. that. Well, that, that was the hurry of the part of the day, you know, hurry up and get there to hurry up and wait. Lots of times you'd have a lineup of three or four hundred in front of you going along trying to pick up your meal. What was the food like? Actually, to me, I thought the food was amazingly good because of all the people they were uh, feeding there. I think in the Manning Depth when I was there, there was something like 6,000 trainees. So. Uh, and that happened in many other places too, of course. But uh, I thought the food was amazingly well for what they had to work with. The worst, worst part of it was, you know, when you come in off a hot parade, a hot day in May and June, you want to go and take a shower. There's too many people in the head, you know, and the hot water was all gone, so you had a cold shower. Not very much privacy. You had your just your little area where your bunk was and your little stall there. And uh, no, there was a, a reading room or a writing room or something like that you could go to for that part. How did you find that? How did you adjust to to that sort of lifestyle? No, oh, I had no problem adjusting to it. It was uh, well, it was the thing of the day, I guess. I just fit in with the rest of them. Of course, the worst thing I did after I got two weeks into training in Manning Depot, I took the measles, spent a week in the hospital. When I got over that, I had to go and start over with another group. So I lost all the group that I was started with in the first place. Well, I got in with the others real well. So your classmates ended up leaving before you then? Yeah, the regular, my first class had left before I left there. Do you remember how long in total you were there then? At Manning Devil? Yeah. Well, it was about a month. I think it was like in weeks, uh, two weeks, four weeks, like, sort of training. Yeah. Lots of guard duty? And uh, no, there wasn't too much of that there. They had their, their guards on there. For, that wasn't part of our mandate at that time, anyway. lectures and how to act and how not to and as uh, learning how to salute you had to get your arm and your finger in the right place. <laughs> did you, were you able to take personal items with you? When you arrived in Toronto what did you have with you? Just what the Air Force gave me. In other words, well no I didn't have any personal items. We were fitted out with a full kit and that's what we took with us. Uh, I know Father, of course, was worried about how we were doing. He thought he'd like to send a Christmas present. He sent a, a shirt for the wear there. No, that was taboo. We could not wear a civilian shirt. And they seemed to know the difference. I thought it was kind of a good rep uh, rep uh, let's see, you know, uh, good match anyway, but they seemed to know, no, you can't use that shirt. Did you have a, much contact with home in the form of letters? Oh, well, of course, I wrote letters regularly, and yes, I received letters. That, that part was good, and I, I, guess I, I, I guess I grew up writing a lot of letters, and so I kept in touch with a lot of relations, and it took quite a bit of time. Was there, Frank, any, um, uh, any of the uh, servicemen from other countries there at Manny Depot? Did you have encounters with Australians or New Zealanders? Or yeah, they had uh, people there, uh, young fellows like that from other countries, but usually they like, say from Australia, it would be a group that had come in as a group, something like we were, and they were just there more or less waiting 
for their next move to the next station. Now they weren't actually in in training, I was marching and all that as we were. But there are other folks there from Australia, New Zealand, uh, England of course, and uh, there's a few from that had joined together from uh, Austria. They had on the, they had escaped from Austria somehow and they had come in there for training and they were in the air crew of course and they were there just for waiting over to get onto the next station. Well, of course, they stuck to themselves as far as their area of training was concerned. When it comes to the uh, go for a meal or something, and of course, you line up and pick up your meal and then go to a table. Well, of course, the folks across the table might have been some of them or, or beside you or something. You just took your place in line where you could find one and go and have your meal. But yeah, we got talking with various ones and that. Yeah, well, the same thing. You could, you'd have to get a pass to go out. You could go, out, I think, from six o'clock till ten o'clock. I think it was on your pass. Go down to town or walk around or visit somebody if you knew where to go. Good <laughs> place to get around. That's right, but it was fairly easy. Did you go to dances or to uh, sporting events? Oh, well, usually it just seems as we go downtown and meet with some other folks and. Probably went and had a pancakes or something, and uh, maybe go to a show. Uh, I don't think it did much dancing in Toronto. It's too hard to find a place like that. Do you have any idea at the time where you were going to be going next? From, from well, I Manny knew, Depot? I knew from Manny Depot that I'd be going to the next technical training school, which was at St. Thomas, which is just south of London, a few miles. Now that was a large complex there. It was actually built in the first place for a mental hospital. But uh, it was not finished till the war started. And then somehow or other they got using it as a barracks for the uh, trainees for the technical training school. And that again was filled with thousands of people and t continuing our training onto um, further training onto uh, engines and even into starting airplanes and things at that time. It would be a Tiger Moth airplane where you, no cell starter, you had to turn on the propeller to start it, like that, so it was a, it was a, a new experience. Not a job I would want. Not too many times. <laughs> so you would have arrived at St. Thomas in the summer of 43, right? That's right, right. yeah. No. Um, Actually, it was getting on closer to fall, I think, it? but uh, okay. no, it was in summer. The, uh, just south of St. Thomas was the uh, Sunnyside Resort on the lake there, and uh, so we could take the bus and go down there for the weekends or even on an evening or something. So had time off that way. Did you hook up with any of your classmates from Winnipeg? Very few. It seems as though they, <coughs> they were going their own way somehow. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them I didn't see until we were posted, then I saw a few of them again posted to a station. So now you're working on engines? Yeah, even getting into a real airplane. <laughs> and uh, would you have been um, uh, in the barracks there at the school, sleeping in, in barracks? No, I would, uh, we were in, uh, like in a hospital actually, as they say, this uh, it was built for a mental hospital. Oh, so oh we had real good barracks there. Yes. So there was, uh, of course, hospital rooms. I think there was just six or eight bunks to a to a room. Okay. So that, well, that could be sixteen in that room, I guess. But uh, lots of buildings for them to use. Then. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Hmm. And how long were you there? Do you we were there. I went there in May. I think I'm right now. No, I was. I left uh, Winnipeg in May. A month in, you have six weeks in Manning Depot because of having the measles and then on there. Yeah, it was in towards June, I think it was there, and I was there three months again. So. And did your um, designation change as you did exams? Did your rank change? Oh, yeah, of course. When we first went in the Air Force, 
first got the uniform, your AC2, as they call it, when we finished finished uh, Winnipeg uh, Ford plant there, we became AC1, and then we took the technical training in St. Thomas, we were AC2, and uh, the next posting from there, I learned a lot, I guess, from airplanes, but anyway, uh, some people went straight from technical training school in St. Thomas out to uh, airports like, say, Winnipeg or uh, Brandon and Rivers on the Ansons and that. But I chose to go to further training to Dorval in Montreal, where we trained there then on larger aircraft, four engine Liberators, the B-24, and the two engine Mitchells, the B-25, and the large V-12 Lancasters, the Merlin engines. So that was a real experience then to get onto these larger aircraft. So then by this time then we were allowed to change the oil in the plane and uh, change the spark plugs and filters and all those kinds of things. We're getting into that closer to the engines by this time. And did you eventually go up in a plane that you'd worked on? Uh, I did later on in Boundary Bay, which maybe we could leave for a little minute. But uh, when we were in Montreal, I had my first ride in an airplane, which was a, a C-47 transport plane. And uh, it was, uh, the joke of that was that, of course, you could not go up in a plane unless you had a parachute. We had to go and sign out a parachute. And the instructions was that you carry this by the shoulder strap. Don't pull that other shiny thing there because it let go in. So we, Chum and I, got our parachutes threw it up into this transport plane. There's no seats, no anything in the back. You see, it's all a big transport for um, all kinds of things. We had the whole thing to run around in, but we were only up there a short time, and something went wrong with one motor, and they had to uh, shut that motor off. So the co-pilot come back and wanted to, where's your, where are your parachutes? Well, they're up there at the front. Well, I said, you go up and sit there beside them, and uh, with your back to the wall, we've got to make an emergency landing. They did not give us any more instructions on the parachute, so we said, well, that's okay. We don't know anything about it. They're just going to make we were quite certain they would make a good landing, but we kind of wondered if maybe it would be something like uh, Mary Poppins, you know, we'd be hanging onto this strap, pull the thing after a while and jump out of their parachute and hang onto the shoulder strap. So what happened? You made it, you made it down. Made it for a perfect landing, and uh, we got out and went back to work. <laughs> Oh well, yes, I was, I was feeling quite at ease. Yes, uh -huh. uh -huh. but I hadn't worked on that particular aircraft. It was just one that was just someone else had signed out. That was all right. We trusted them. Yeah, <laughs> one had to work together and trust each other all the time. I guess. Yeah. Um, so working in uh, Dorval, we worked on a crew of four people would work on a, on a motor on a one, yeah, you know, one motor for change and plugs and that. These planes are being used to go overseas as uh, sometimes for, uh, it's what they call 45 Transport Group, was the name of the people, and they were fitting these planes up to fly overseas to, to have the, uh, add to the planes on, to fly over them Germany later on. So, from Derval, you chose well, from Dorval, uh, usually that was an overseas posting. So we finished our course and we were given our needles to go overseas and given a furlough to go home first for two two week furlough. And they came all the way back here north of Brandon, had my furlough and went all the way back to Dorval. And then the next day they told us that we're going to get on the train and go all the way back to near Vancouver to Boundary Bay. So we had nice couple of days, a long train ride there. So that was our next posting at 40, number 5 OTU in Boundary Bay. So they, uh, then again, we were working on these same planes, the Liberators and Mitchells and Lancasters. And again, and a crew of four. So that became quite, well, quite uh, 
what is the word I want to put there that uh, is very definite that we were to have these done right. When we were in Dorval, of course, it was all inspected again by someone else, and here we were just working with a corporal over us, and we were doing the job. And again, we were into changing spark plugs and changing the oil. Of course, we always made, had to take the cowlings off, and always made sure we put them back on properly. We didn't want them to fall off. One story about changing spark plugs. There's all both these radial engines on the Liberator and the Mitchell were 18 cylinder radial and they each had two spark plugs in the, each cylinder. Uh, we had a little problem there for one particular little time where the spark plugs would seize in the hole in the thing and we would break them off when we tried to take them out. And uh, the flight lieutenant there was getting a little discouraged with us. So why are you breaking so many spark plugs? You're going to add it too hard, you know, you're not doing gentle enough. But, uh, well, so we did the best we could. <clears throat> but he agreed then to come sometime when we had a spark plug that was hard to get off. And he agreed to come and take it out. And sure enough, he twisted it off. So that was all right. But that means you had to lift the whole cylinder block off the piston, get that piece of spark plug out of there, and then put it back together <coughs> and again sign it out as it's okay. So we're quite pleased to flick lieutenant come to see. Yeah. After that he changed the lubrication that they put on the spark plug so they didn't seize in like that. It was a lot better. Did you see a lot of change in the technology, Frank, as, as you went along in your training? Did the well, planes change a lot? Yeah, the planes were yeah, they were gradually changing. Of course, they never did get to a jet or anything like that, but they were gradually changing and improving and that kind of thing. Did you have favorite planes you like to work on? Favorite engines? Oh well, they were so close together. Though. The uh, the Liberators had Pratt and Whitney motors, 18 cylinders, but the the other ones, the Mitchells had uh, 18 cylinder Cyclone motors. But they were so similar that there was there's no real difference in them really, but. So I guess they're both our favorites. We didn't care that much for the Lancaster Merlin motors. They were glycol, antifreeze cooled, and they, they would leak more often than, of course, the others were air cooled. They didn't have these oil leak or glycol leaks that way. So we like to stay with the radial motors. What was life like in Boundary Bay in Vancouver? Boundary was very, was very busy. There's up close to 6,000 people there in training then. And these flights, uh, it's the final training, operation training for the pilots. And they would take daytime flights out long all day back, and then all night and back. So there's a lot of hours put on. So then we're working on three shifts, three eight hour shifts a day to keep these planes all flying. So it was quite different going for meals at midnight and things that way. But we did have time off, we changed the shift and then we'd have a day or so off. We can go skating in New Westminster, we can go dancing there, or we can skate in Vancouver or go to shows. How would you get there? There was a bus line row that went from the bay into Bond from Boundary Bay Airport into New Westminster. <coughs> and then there's good connection there in New Westminster, Vancouver or wherever from there. But then there's a highway out half a mile north of the airport where we were very well taken, I guess. We could go out there and hitchhike and very usually could get a ride into New Westminster and get a ride back again, so that helped quite a bit. Did you get to know anyone in the community, go to their house? Uh, not very many. We'd, we learned to, met a few in skating and that way, but uh, no, we didn't go visiting that much there that way. Touched by war than the prairies, that's for sure. Do yeah. you see evidence of that? By the time we arrived there, the real threat of the German of the Japanese invasion was over. And of course when we got there the windows on the hangars were all painted dark green so they didn't show light out and if the Japanese came over or anything like that. But uh, the uh, 
the threat of the Japanese at that time was over. And of course, the Japanese citizens had been moved out before that. But one of the first jobs at Bondre Bay was this, seeing as how they, they didn't think the Japanese were going to invade, we had to get up and scrape the paint off these windows uh, this time so I could have more daylight. Didn't have to have the lights on all day in the hangar. You could have <laughs> sunshine and <again. laughs> that, was, that was quite a lot of fun. Of course, you scrape real hard, you could break the window, then you didn't need to scrape any longer. <laughs> Well, I got there in, I think it was in March 1944 till September 1945. That's remember, when the war was over. Like, do you remember who you were doing? Oh, yes. We were working away and uh, something at that time, and uh, it was announced over the, the system there that the war was over in Europe, that uh, peace had been declared. Everybody said, hooray, and start putting their tools away and out the gate for the rest of the day. They didn't even give us a pass or anything. We were on our own. So we could, they did suggest we better come back in the morning. But <laughs> went up, met, uh, joined in with the crowds downtown where there was toilet paper coming out the windows and, and uh, people throwing papers around all over the place and cheering, etc., etc. Everybody was everybody's friend. Yes, kind of relieved, yes. It's just, uh, we knew then that that part was over, but we still had to go back to work and because of the threat yet of the Japanese war, we still, there was, the pilots still continued training and we still continued working because we were the trainees there. BJ Day? BJ Day was just as exciting, maybe, maybe a little more so because that, that was the finale. So uh, we were able to well, we had another, I guess we had another celebration up in town there when the streets were crowded and that kind of thing. But, uh, it was shortly after that that uh, we were told that put things away, clean things up, and uh, we would soon be discharged. Remember the day you were discharged? Oh, well, yes, I can remember that quite well. Uh, said goodbye to our friends, and we weren't sure if we'd see them again or not, but. Uh, it's kind of a sad day in a way for that part, but it was a happy day that I knew father was looking for him to get back for me and things like that. Um, and you would have uh, gone home on the train mm -hmm. to say goodbye to friends on the way. They would all be getting off at various... For some reason, I seem to be the only one coming this way. There's more than oh. a lot of them got for, uh, were at home already in Vancouver. And some of them were going, well, I guess there must have been a few, I guess, that said along the way that we still say goodbye to. Would you have been wearing civilian clothes or still wearing uniforms? I was still wearing uniforms. Wearing I didn't have any civilian clothes at that time. But uh, we, we, wore the, we were allowed to wear a uniform for a month after being discharged. So, we, that way. so you took the train back to Winnipeg? Uh, back to Rivers, actually. Back to, oh, you, oh, of course. Yeah. Sure. That was uh, our, our home was just 12 miles north of Rivers, so that's where I went by. Oh yes, father was waiting for me there. Well, this time he was he was uh, ready to retire. He wanted me to get into farming real seriously, and he was willing to retire. So. What about your brothers? Then? My brothers were both discharged before I was. They, uh, well, one brother was not well enough. I guess he was had asthma attacks, that was not too uh, comfortable. And the other brother was, uh, well, he just finished his job. I can't remember what he was doing at that time, but he, he was discharged and he was back home on the farm before I was. Good. So then you resumed farming. I resumed farming and uh, I guess I'll have to say then that uh, I met a young lady out there in New Westminster and uh, a year later, yeah, during the latter part of the flying at uh, Bondi Bay, I met this lady, and uh, later on then, a year later, I went back to New Westminster and was married, and wow. came back to the farm, and then father moved into Brandon. Where did the two of you meet? 
uh, we met at a dance in, in Westminster. I think the dance was at the YWCA. So we, so I guess we got along well dancing. And she's been dancing ever since. Uh, not really. Uh, we had to think about it a little longer. <laughs> so you went back to Rivers and okay. kept in contact. Yeah, kept in contact. No, and then invited the lady to come to Rivers and see what where we were and know what we and see what the possibilities were and future or something. Was she involved in the war effort? Uh, yes, she was involved in the war effort. In fact, I brought a little story here from her. She doesn't care to go on camera. I have the story of her. She worked in the Canadian Pacific Repair Depot, which is also in New Westminster. She had taken training uh, business college for uh, checking or taking care of inventory. So she worked in a, in a furniture store and uh, taking inventory till the, this thing came up at the uh, Canadian Pacific uh, Repair Depot where they wanted somebody to take care of inventory and that was taking care of all the parts that were brought in for repair to where they repair the planes and uh, so she was taking uh, putting this of course there were no computers in those days didn't even have electric typewriter all this was put onto file cards all the information printed on or written on whichever on file cards and she was in charge of all this so uh, she first went there, she was alone in this, but the more and more planes were coming in, and finally she had a staff of eight, 10 or 12 under her t bringing in this inventory. And her remark about the inventory, that a wing would come in and then maybe a complete wing for an aircraft would have four numbers on it, and uh, maybe a, a package of bolts or nuts or screws or something would have a line of eight or 10 numbers on a thing like on a small package like that. The big package had four numbers. <laughs> so I maybe should repair or suggest that this uh, Canadian Pacific Air Repair Depot was not an Air Force station, it was Canadian Pacific, but they had, like the rest of the companies, would help out the war effort by allowing planes to come in there for repair because they were repairing their own planes all the time also. And this was on, along the river. They could not fly into there. Any plane, supposing one of our smaller planes, training planes, was go for repair. They bring it in on a barge, and then they load it onto a ramp and into there. So there's no, there were no runways at this repair depot, which was different. Yeah. Very different from where you were. Mm-hmm. Wow. Can you think of any other stories to Oh, I don't know what other stories, really. Uh, I think maybe I told too much though. <laughs> Is it hard, Frank, to readjust to civilian life? No, it's the same. It's, I don't know. I guess I adjust easily. Uh, when I went into the Air Force, I thought, well, that's the way it is, and that's the way I'm going to be. When I come back to farm, well, I was willing to start farming then. And of course, I, mean, I had my wife there to help me then, and uh, yeah, we raised two children there, and they're doing well. And, but they didn't care to farm. They went other other business. And so uh, we retired from the farm in 1985, moved into Brandon, and the first thing I know I was in, back in the airplanes of the Commonwealth Air Training Plant Museum. And I, as of today, well, I'm still involved there. So I think that was a good ending. Thanks for talking. Yeah, I mean, very, my pleasure. <laughs> Have to take a hammer and shut it off. <laughs> you shut it off inside anyway, I think. Yes.